Welcome to Casual Friday. I have four things I want to cover today. One is I released a new pattern today, Mock Me Gently, which I will tell you about in a minute. I have some works in progress. I want to do the final uh, tour of my knitting library uh, today, which is a little bit of a mishmash and I want to talk about gift knitting and surprises. I, I've talked, I feel like I've talked about this a couple of times in the past this time of year because this is the time of year when we tend to do gift knitting. Last week I talked about who is knit worthy and so this week I want to talk a little bit about planning for surprise gifts and how to go about knitting for somebody the first time around. So let's get started. Sometime in, I believe it was in October, I showed you some hats that I knit a few weeks ago, or a few years ago. I designed them in the spring of 2017. Uh, they're these two hats. They're similar, but slightly different. They both are made using mock cables. So it's not real cables. You aren't reordering stitches. You're not using a cable needle. They're done using a co combination of increases and decreases, and they create the illusion of cables without actually being a cable. And what's nice about them is that you use the same stitch count that you would use if you were knitting something in stockinette. So you can use that reference. You can think about, well, if I was going to knit a hat in stockinette, how many stitches would I need? That's how many I would need if I'm going to do mock cables. Now, because there are columns of pearls, the fabric doesn't want to pull in a little bit when it's resting, but otherwise it has the same stretch that stockinette has. So there are two main versions of the pattern. This one has yarn overs or open yarn overs that are created and that is really typical of mock cables that they're done using yarn overs and decreases and there's two kinds of two basic kinds of cable of mock cables being used we've got these little mini mock cables at the bottom that are very commonly used in japanese uh, knitting patterns and then we have these mock cables in the main body of the hat that are mirrored. So this is a fairly large repeat. It takes 20 stitches to create the whole repeat. And that means that for an adult hat that's 100 stitches, you can use worsted weight yarn, but it's really difficult to size up and down by 20 stitches. So what I did was that I created five different sizes each size uses a different yarn weight and needle size. So you can use the exact same set of instructions, but if you choose to use fingering weight, you get an infant size hat. If you use sport weight, you get a hat that's good for a baby that's maybe, that's really toddler size, like 12 months to 18 or 24 months. Then you have a child size using DK weight and an adult size using worsted weight, which is what these are. And then if you have a large adult head, you can use Aran weight yarn. So uh, this one, as I showed you, has yarn over increases. This is the same hat, but with some different, instead of having the yarn overs create eyelets, they're closed. And so they, when you close, when you work them on the following round, you're going to work them so that they twist and they essentially create a make one increase, but they lean in different directions depending on how you create the increases. And then again, at the bottom in the ribbing, we have these little mock cables that are slightly different from the ones that you see typically in the Japanese stitch um, dictionaries and in their knitting patterns. So they have these two different versions of the hat and then there's an additional what I call futsy option for how you work the ribbing um, that allows you, uh, while the big cables are mirrored in the body, these little cables are not mirrored and that's going to bug some people. Um, in this particular, particular version with the closed yarn overs, the way that the mock cable looks like it's leaning is a little bit more obvious and so you might really want a mirrored 
um, cable. It's kind of a futzy move, so I do include it, but it isn't just in the standard um, hat pattern. So there's kind of, if you're not very adventurous, you could start out with just the open yarn overs because it's a simpler, all of the increases are yarn overs. Um, it'd be a little bit easier. And then you could, you could work your way up um, to, be, to try more, more of a challenge if you wanted to later. The instructions, you can choose between fully written instructions or if you like charts, there are charted instructions. So regardless of which version you use and whether you prefer written or charted instructions, there's an option for you. The crown of the hat maintains the stitch pattern even as you're decreasing. And there are, there are specific instructions in the pattern for how you can modify the length of the crown so that you get the actual length that you want in the hat. There's, the, there's a standard length listed in the pattern. You can go by that, um, but you may have a different row gauge than another knitter would have. And so there are instructions for before you start working the crown, how you can determine if you want to add a few rows or eliminate a few rows or just knit it exactly as it's written. It's all spelled out for you in the pattern. So because there are so many different combinations of yarn weights and versions, uh, I had a lot of test knitters. I think I had eight or 10 test knitters. And then I also had the pattern tech edited. So if you're interested in this mock cable pattern, uh, mock cable hat, here's the little infant version of it. Same hat, just with a thinner yarn weight and smaller needles. Um, the link to the pattern Ravelry is down in the video description. So this past week, I went to Michigan to visit my family. And as I typically do when I'm sitting at the gate or sitting on the airplane, I started a sock project. I always take sock yarn with me. And I also look up the nearest yarn shop in case I have a yarn emergency. I packed a lot of yarn with me, partly because I was going to be seeing family and I thought I might offer uh, to make socks for them they might want to pick some yarn out but i ended up needing to go to a yarn shop a local yarn shop while i was there so this is the sock that i started on the plane this is using barocco socks i'll put the color number down in the video description i don't remember what the color number is and as I was working the leg and seeing how the colors played out, I was thinking about what kind of heel I wanted to knit. And these days, I'm really apt to put in a peasant heel. And I think part of that is because of how many years I was knitting socks not able to knit a peasant heel because they were just too small for me. I have such a high instep. And so a few years ago, once I figured out exactly how I needed to modify a sock in order to get a good fit with a peasant heel, I've kind of been on a peasant heel kick. And for a while, I was just using uh, whatever uh, the, sti the yarn was at the end of the ball, I would use that for the heel. So the heels may or may not have matched, but I would still use the same yarn. But I have really, I really enjoy using a contrast yarn for the heel. Um, if I can find one that I think is going to work well. So I went to the shop. And I was looking for solid sock yarns. I love it when a yarn shop carries solid sock yarns in 50 gram balls. So I don't have to buy a whole 100 grams in order to use just, you know, 10 or 15 grams for the heel. And this shop carried a brand that I often use for my contrast heels, which is Brown Sheep Yarns Wildfoot. And so I went there and we were looking and there was a green that went pretty well with the, there was some green in the sock. And, but I looked at it and I'm like, oh, but I have, I have that exact green at home and I didn't really want to buy another skein of the same green, but I needed something now. And so the, the woman at the shop uh, recommended this brown color and I hadn't even realized that this dark stripe was brown. I had thought it was gray. I was working in kind of dim light in my mom's um, apartment and so it, I, I got the brown and I really really like it. So I finished up the sock while I was there and I started the second one when I was on the, uh, air, on the plane coming back. It's a very short flight. It's like a one hour flight 
um, from the airport in Michigan to here in Minneapolis. And once in a while, I'll sit next to somebody who is kind of looks at my knitting and says something like, oh, that's a lost art, or my grandma crochets, and then you have to explain that, it, well, it's not crocheting, it's knitting, or whatever. But I don't really get comments that often when I'm on the plane. One time, somebody said to me, because I had DPNs, they let you on the plane with those? Like, yes, they, they let me on the plane with these. So... Those are the kind of comments I usually get. Well, this guy, he was watching a movie on his little uh, iPad. And then after a while, he kind of put it down and he said to me, he was, I was knitting these um, using Magic Loop on a 32-inch needle. And he said, is that cable, is, are those metal parts, are those hollow? Does that cable go up inside? Like, how, what's going on there? It looks a lot like this equipment that I use, these tools that I use to create fishing lures. And um, so I was showing him how the needles work and talking to him about, and he said, you're knitting a sock? Because I only, I was working on the ribbing. So I pulled the sock out and showed it to him. And he was like, oh, that's really amazing. And uh, he had a lot of questions. He kept saying, I'm sorry to bother you. I'll let you get back. I'm like, no, I, I love talking about needles. It's like really fun for me to, to talk about it. So I did start the second sock on my way back. Um, I haven't finished it yet. The other thing I'm working on right now is a variation of a sweater I wear a lot um, on, in, on, in my videos. It's a variation on this sweater, which just has that one cable up the side. It's a v-neck and it's got this nice wide ribbing and it's two-tone. My daughter borrowed this uh, at her college graduation. It was really cold and rainy outside and we were running from our hotel to a restaurant about a block away and I let her use my sweater. And, um, and she's, and I asked her if she would like one. I said, oh, that's a really cute sweater on you. And um, asked her if she would want me to knit her one because I'd been wanting to knit another one and write up a pattern for it. So she does want one, but she wants all of these cha changes to it. So I'm gonna have to make one for her and then make another one for myself that's more like what I want to release as a pattern. Um, this I knit originally bottom up, and again, it's two tones that had to be knit um, flat and then seamed. I could have done it in intarsia, but it, it, that would have required planning ahead of time, and the reason the sweater is two-tone is because I stopped working on it for a number of years and then used the light gray yarn for other things and I had to introduce a contrast yarn. So there was no planning ahead of time on this. This sweater turned out the way it turned out because I didn't plan ahead. So this sweater has a single closure right at the waist. It's actually a magnet and what she wants is to actually have it with buttons like five buttons. So it's probably not quite as uh, the closures would start up sooner. She wants a narrower ribbing and she wants the sweater to be shorter because she's 22 years old and crop sweaters are all the rage. She also wants to be able to wear it without uh, anything except underwear on underneath or to, to be able to wear it over the top of other clothes. So she doesn't live near me and I am not completely sure of the fit, how this is going to fit her. When I knit for myself, I know exactly how deep I want my armholes, how long I want the body. So I can knit it bottom up and get any stitch patterns established and then do the shaping at the top. I just prefer to knit that way. I talked about this a couple weeks ago, but for her, uh, I'm not 100% sure how deep the armholes are going to be. I have a plan for it and I'm really not sure how long she actually wants um, the sweater to be because I, I can't measure her. I can't measure another item that she has because she doesn't live here. So I'm knitting it top down with simultaneous set-in sleeves and this is a tricky, I find it the trickiest way to start a sweater. Um, of every method and because there's a lot of short rowing involved and increases and placing of markers and establishing patterns everything's going on all at one time and so it takes a lot of focus and concentration and because I'm developing this pattern myself <laughs> there's a lot of ripping out and saying well that didn't really work out the way I 
charted it. I don't like the way it actually works out. So I've been ripping it out and restarting a couple of times. So I'll show you the progress on that. I think I can get pretty far this weekend with getting the actual start going because I am, I think I'm on my third or fourth start of it and I haven't quite decided if I'm happy with how things are starting. So that is the other thing that I'm working on that I can't really show you right now. So I have a few books that didn't quite fit into the categories that I've done before. Some of them are Stitch Dictionary or Stitch Dictionary like, um, including one that is uh, that I have in, in digital format only. And then I have another digital book that's an old book that's available in um, digital version or hard copy. I chose to get digital. And then I want to show you some of the books that are on this shelf here, which are not, they're, they're books that are related to knitting. They're mostly books that are about knitting. Some of them actually do have some patterns in them, but they're books that are about knitting and they're not really necessarily meant to be pattern books or stitch dictionaries, but I find them very interesting. I did a bunch of videos this fall, technique videos related to cables and, uh, and related to chart reading, reading charts. And so some of that was reading cable charts. And somebody had asked me about doing a video on Japanese stitch charts, which are kind of a different beast. Um, in Japan, they have absolutely standardized their charting and their knitting patterns are a chart. Typically one size, which is one of the reasons that you can produce a pattern in just schematic form and, and stitch pattern form. Every chart symbol has been standardized. But the problem is that doesn't necessarily mean you know by looking at it uh, at a specific chart symbol that you know what it means. You can probably make some guesses based on how it's related to other chart symbols, but they do get a little bit tricky. So I don't know if I'll do a video on Japanese stitches. I think, um, we'll see. <laughs> but I did want to show you that I actually do have a couple of Japanese uh, stitch dictionaries. And so this is one. Obviously, this just says knitting patterns 260, and then it's got a bunch of other words on it that I don't know. And the other thing is that some of these Japanese stitch dictionaries are printed in China. And so sometimes they, it's like a Chinese version of a Japanese stitch dictionary, but I think this is actually in Japanese. The, everything's charted and then at the very back of the book, they've got some information on some very sort of specific or unique um, stitch patterns that occur in this book and how to read the symbols for those. You can find some information online for some of the symbols that get used over and over and over again and how those are incorporated into, say, cable symbols. Uh, you can find that kind of information online. But they have really intricate stitch patterns in here. It's, they're, they're very similar. A lot of them are very similar to Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns, but they really have their own take on them. But they are very elaborate and intricate and um, interesting. So there's this one that says 260 on it. And then, and then I have this one which says 250 knitting patterns. So I'll put the links to all of the books down below. Uh, but they, they're just, you know, again, just uh, chart after chart after chart and with color photographs. Um, let me just give you an example. So they'll have a color photograph next to the chart so you can um, compare what's going on um, in each of those. Another book that I consider a stitch dictionary of sorts is this book. I've talked about this book in the past a few times. It's called Sequence Knitting and it's by Cecilia uh, Campo Chiaro, I believe is how she would pronounce her last name. So sequence, and she teaches this um, concept in various workshops around the country too. One of the things I love about this book is I guess her mother was a librarian. And so when she, I don't know if she self-published this book or who she worked with to get this published, but she wanted a library binding because she wanted a book that you could lay on the table flat. 
So, so it's really nice. So this is a book that's meant to last and not, it's not going to fall apart. So sequence knitting, the idea of sequence knitting is that you pick a sequence that could be just a couple of stitches or it could be, you know, many, many stitches long. But it's a sequence of knit stitches and purl stitches and some combination of them and that gets repeated over and over and over again. And there are a couple of ways that these kinds of stitch patterns can play out. One of them is that every row is worked identically. So like mistake rib is that way. It's knit to purl to ribbing, but you have an extra stitch. You either have one extra stitch or, or three extra stitches. So you don't have a multiple of four. And every row is worked the same. So you work knit to purl to all the way across. And then you'd end with maybe a knit one or maybe you'd end with knit two purl one, something like that. And then you work the same, um, the same sequence on the next row. And then you get this result that is sort of like ribbing, um, but it has columns of garter stitch that separate the columns of knits with the columns of purls. So that's a very common, well-known sequence. Well, other sequences can be used the same way. And you, again, you could start every row, work every row exactly the same. So this is the kind of thing that makes it very easy to knit when you're commuting on a bus or a train, or if you're on an airplane or something you're traveling, or you're in front of the TV and you want, don't want to have to keep referring to written instructions or even charted instructions. So that's one way of doing sequence knitting. Another way is that when you get to the end of the row, where you left off in the sequence, maybe it's a 12 stitch sequence, but you don't have a multiple of 12. So wherever you left off, say you left off on stitch seven out of 12 at the end of the row, then you would start the next row with stitch eight and you would keep going that way. So, so it creates a different um, textures and surfaces, but it, it makes it interesting to knit and it's easy to remember how to do that. And then the third possibility for sequence knitting is if you're knitting in the round. And so that's going to be, you could have the same sequence knitting flat as you have in the round, but they're not gonna play out the same. And so in the round, you tend to have spiral results. So you have a pattern that's going to move diagonally across the surface. So that's one thing. So this book is it explains each of these methods of using sequences and then has a ton of different sequences in here. So if you are the kind of knitter who doesn't like to have to really think much when you're knitting, um, this gives you a lot of ideas and allows you to see how those ideas will play out. There's one thing about uh, knits and purls and how they interact is that when you chart them out, that's not always what it really looks like when you knit it because of the way that knits and purls interact with each other vertically and horizontally. You can sometimes end up with something that doesn't look the way that you pictured it. So this gives you uh, an idea of what something's going to look like without you having to actually swatch it yourself. She also has in here ways of working um, say scarves and shawls that are asymmetrical and how you can maintain those, how you can use these sequence, uh, these sequences and still end up with something that's really cool and, and looks like it was purposely meant uh, knit that way. So this is the kind of thing, especially if you're doing flat knitting like scarves or blankets or shawls or things like that, that can really give you a lot of ideas of stitch patterns that you can use to just break up the monotony. Okay, so I have, I think about six books over here. I'm just gonna start at the at one end and go all the way over. So two of these books have very, very similar names. This one is called Knitting Around the World and it's by Leila Nargi. So this book talks about various knitting traditions in different parts of the world, it has a lot of color uh, photograph. It's, it's really a kind of a coffee table book. And there are some historical knitting patterns in here as well. So this is the kind of book that, that you know, for me, it's like sitting in bed and, and looking at it at night. That, that's the kind of thing. And, and reading things um, about and just getting a sort of a visual sample of what people do in different parts of the world, just to gain some familiarity with that. So that's knitting around the world. Oh, these are the two that are similar. That one's a more unique name. This one is called Knitting America, A Glorious Heritage from Warm Socks to High Art by Susan M. Strawn and with a foreword by Melanie Fallick. 
So this is um, sort of specifically knitting in the United States at different time periods and what kinds of things people were knitting. And there's a lot of photographs. You'll see um, colorful advertisements, um, different uh, sweater patterns and, and pictures of people, photographs of people knitting. And there are some uh, knitting patterns in here as well, some historical knitting patterns. So again, another coffee table type of book. So this one is called Knitting America. And this one is called Knitting in America. And this one is by Melanie Fallick. The other one had the foreword by Melanie Fallick. So this is Knitting in America. And what this one is about, it's really profiles of uh, several dozen designers and, and producers um, just about what knitting is like in America, more in the modern age. The other one was more of a historical perspective with uh, vintage patterns and photos in there. So this is a, a book about contemporary um, designers and what knitting is like in America today. This book is called Knitting Fashion Industry Craft by Sandy Black. So this is a book I bought early in the year when I first started getting into uh, vintage knitting and I wanted to know more about historically what was going on and with it with knitting and trying to understand more about fashion and understanding how hand knitting influenced machine knitting and vice versa. Um, that's not necessarily what this book is about, but it's an interesting book. It, um, and it's got, again, a lot of historical uh, things about fashion, but specifically knitted fashion. So that's what this book is about. So this is a book I bought years ago, but it's still available. It might be available in paperback, but I bought it when it was first out. It's called No Idle Hands, The Social History of American Knitting. And I come back to it every so often and look at it. I don't think I've ever read it just straight through. It's the kind of book that I, all of these are kind of books that I flip through and look things up and oh, I wonder if that book would have something about it, especially when it comes to uh, knitting history and I, and social history, often that's the, that's the kind of history where, where you will read about women is in social history because political history tends to be wars and kings and presidents and, and uh, power <laughs> grabs. Um, but social history is, is really about how people lived. And so that tends to be more interesting to me. So again, a No Idle Hands, The Social History of Knitting by Anne L. MacDonald. Last book is The History of Hand Knitting by Richard Rutt. And so this is a book that I bought when I was doing the Master Hand Knitting Program. And it's, it's mostly a history of hand knitting in the British Isles. It's written by a man, this Richard Rutt, he was a bishop. And he was the first person to really treat the topic of knitting in an academic way and citing sources and going to museums and seeing things in person for himself. He describes uh, different ways of knitting like the Eastern versus Western which has to do with how the stitches are sitting on the needles. He uh, talked about the tools that people use, um, traditional knitting of different types in different parts of the British Isles. So to me, this was, this is fascinating. It's, it's different than the social history that we have um, that I just talked about. It's really interesting. And he, like I said, he really treated it as an academic topic with lots of sources. I've always loved this book. So I, that ends my library tour. I didn't, sh oh, 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 there are two other books that I wanted to tell you about that are digital books. One is on stranded color work. When I was sh showing you all my stranded color work books, um, they were mostly were either stitch dictionaries that had, uh, that were on Farrow, which was a specific knitting tradition, a subset of stranded color work, or they were pattern books that were about a specific knitting tradition in various parts of Northern Europe. Um, so there are pattern books that included a lot of stitch patterns in them. So those were all traditional. There is a book called Alternates 
uh, that is produced by Interweave Knits and it's really contemporary stranded color work stitch patterns. It's really interesting. I used it, I think it was last year, I did a uh, an article for Interweave, one of their magazines, and it was on stranded color work. And they sent me this a digital copy of this book for me to pick stitch patterns from. And I loved it. I have used that book several times, but I, I don't always remember that I have it because it's not physically on my shelves. I have to remember it and go get it off my computer. So it has all kinds of interesting categories of things, like it could be animals or it could be just geometric things, um, but they're really different and they're not what you're going to find in traditional stranded color work um, books. So that one I really do feel like if you really are into stranded color work but you want more contemporary um, stitch patterns, that would be a good book to have. And then the final book that I have, and again I have it in digital format, it's Mary Thomas's Knitting Book and it was published back in the 1930s. You can get it in hard copy format or you can get it in a digital format. It has little drawings and illustrations that by today's standards are going to be considered politically incorrect and sometimes just downright racist. But the information in the book is worth seeing from a historical perspective, like what was actually in a knitting techniques book. I found a lot of reference books from the 19th century and into the early 20th century. And this is really one of the few books that I have found from a little bit further into the 20th century. So I would be really curious if anybody knows of any other knitting reference books that were sort of uh, expansive that um, were published around that time. But she included things in there that you don't, don't see other places. Uh, and some of it was based on traditional work, but she, unlike Richard Rutt, didn't really cite sources. She would just say something was true and you had to take it on face value. But it is an interesting book, uh, but just be cautioned that it, it is the product of its time. So last week I was talking about a, who is knit worthy, at least in, in my world, and, and always keeping in mind um, what's important to me. I'm always talking about keeping the joy in knitting. So it's really important that I enjoy what I'm knitting and that I want to knit for another person. The problem that you can run into is that you get really excited about knitting something for somebody. You wanna knit them a surprise. You don't want them to know about it. You wanna knit them a surprise and you have you build up in your mind how much they're going to love it. And maybe they will love it. Maybe they'll love that you spent all that time and effort and they love the color, but it doesn't fit because you didn't have a chance to measure them because you had to make some assumptions about how things were gonna fit or they love knitted items and would love a knitted item from you that you made, but the thing that you made them isn't something that they can use. And then you have to be pretty sure of the other person's taste and what kinds of things, uh, and whether you are actually good at choosing things for them. Like if you were to buy them a gift, like if you were to go to the mall and buy them a sweater or a hat or a pair of mittens, would it be something that they liked or would it be something that they would end up returning later and getting getting um, something that they liked better? So that those are the things that I think about. Knitting takes so much time and effort and you want to produce something for somebody that they will love and that they will want to wear. And because of that, I tend not to knit a surprise gift for most people at all, but particularly when I'm knitting for them for the first time, because I'm terrible at <laughs> picking out things um, for other people, clothing items. I'm terrible at it. Every time I think, oh, that is so totally something that you know my daughter would love or that my husband would like or whatever, I'm always wrong. And they're like, no, I don't like that. Oh, I like this other thing better. 
And a lot of times they pick a yarn, a color or a texture that I never would have guessed, or they pick a stitch pattern. You know, I'm looking at stitch patterns that I want to knit, and often those are not the stitch patterns that people want to wear. <laughs> so you kind of have to go through things with them. For my husband, he's very particular, and I, and the thing that I knit for him is hats. I've knit him a couple pairs of socks. I've knit him a couple of sweaters. And now that I've knit him a hat nearly every year for the past, I don't know, six or seven years, I can guess pretty well now what he is likely to want. But he also has his own Ravelry account. And so he will go through and look for things that he likes and then he might suggest something to me. Then I'm more than happy to knit him um, what he wants. And I kind of have an idea of what colors he's gonna want in his hat. And if I'm at the yarn shop, I might take some pictures, send them to him, say, do you like this or that? Or if I'm looking through my stash, I'll say, well, this is what I have on hand. Do any of these appeal to you? If not, I'll go out and, and look for something. So I have found that I need to be really careful about what I knit for other people because I, I don't guess well. I mentioned, I think it was last week, that, that there was a year where I gave little gift certificates to all my writing friends, and most of them did not pick the thing that I thought they would want, which was socks. A few of them did, but most of them picked something that wasn't socks, and they didn't necessarily pick a color that I would have imagined that they would want either. So I, I did knit them the things that they wanted with some guidance from them. I didn't have them come to the yarn shop with me and pick out the yarns, but you know, based on some guidance, based on the kinds of colors that they wanted and knowing what I've seen them point to before in the past that they really liked, that really helped me figure out what to knit for them. So one of the things that I do when I'm in a gathering of friends or family and I haven't knit for them before and I'm thinking that I might like to knit for them before and I've asked them if they are interested in having me knit something and we've have have a discussion typically when I knit for other people I'm knitting them an accessory of some point and so I will trace their foot and take the relevant measurements I have a video <laughs> on how to measure um, for socks. I've got another one on how to measure for a hat and how to measure for mittens. I've got all of those. I'll put them up there. And uh, so what I do is I have a piece of paper on one side of the paper. I trace their foot and then take the circumference measurements that I need. And then on the other half of the uh, other side of the paper, I trace their hand and any circumference, relevant circumference information. And then I measure their head. I measure their head just above their ears, all the way around. And then I uh, ask them where they like their hat to come down on their head. And so a lot of people, and I live in Minnesota, and in the, in the Midwest, we like hats that actually cover our head, our ears because it's cold here. Um, so they show me where they want, want it to come. I measure up over the top of their head. And then I ask them, do they like to have the ribbing folded back so that I know that I need to, to knit additional ribbing as well. And so for that, I just draw a little bit of a head and I write the, the information on that sheet of paper. And I have a file folder full of all of this information that I keep in my um, shelf uh, next to all of my uh, books. And so if I'm going to knit for somebody, I just refer to that. So I don't rely on trying to guess somebody's uh, foot size based on their shoe size because that isn't, you're, you might knit a sock they can wear, but it's probably not going to fit well. You might get lucky, but I, if, if I'm going to put that much time into something, I want it to fit well. I want them to like it. I want them to want to wear it. And so I, I, for, for me, it's not worth trying to surprise somebody with their very first knitted item and then have disappointment. For me, there's nothing worse than being really excited about giving somebody a gift that you've knitted for them and, and to see the polite smile and thanks. And, it, and you can tell that they're disappointed and then that disappoints you or they're excited about it and they put it on and it doesn't fit them. Uh, so really, I just think it's better to surprise them with like a gift certificate for that knitted item and then 
spend some time with them talking about what they might want and planning for it and getting their input. That is my approach. It may not be your approach. You may have perfect taste and understand exactly what somebody else is going to want and knit it to exactly the right size without having to measure them. If you can do that, then you have a superpower that I would really like to have, but I don't have that superpower. So, um, so that's my philosophy on gift knitting and surprises. So that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.